to you tonight, I am thinking of you as a visible token of encouragement to the whole country. You are evidence that we are seeking to get away just as fast as we possibly can from the door. To get away from free lodging houses, to get away from soup kitchens. Because the government is paying you wages and maintaining you to do actual work. Work which is needed now and for the future. Work that will bring a definite financial, practical return to the people of the nation in the future. Through you, the nation will graduate a fine group of strong young men, clean living, trained to self-discipline, and above all, willing and proud to work for the joy of working. That, my friends, must be the new spirit of the American future. And you are the vanguard of that new spirit. from Massachusetts is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself two minutes. The gentleman is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank Chairman Lucas and Ranking Member Peterson for all their hard work on this very difficult bill. I admire their ten tenacity and I admire their passion on, uh, on issues dealing with, with agriculture. There are some good things in this bill, to be sure, but there are some things that uh, I simply cannot accept. I think as we discuss this farm bill that we, we should remind ourselves of a few simple facts. Facts like this. Hunger exists in the United States of America. Not a single congressional district in this country is hunger free. Our food banks, our food pantries, the people who are on the front lines in the fight against hunger simply cannot do any more. They're stretched to the limit. And one final fact. This bill will make hunger worse in America, not better. We're the richest country in the history of the world, and uh, I think we all should be ashamed of the fact that uh, tens of millions of our fellow citizens are hungry or food insecure. I often say in speeches, if you open up your kitchen cupboard and there's a can of tuna fish in there but nothing else, you're not hungry, but there's a real risk you're going to be hungry. Food insecurity is really not having access to food or being at real risk of not having access to the food. Food insecurity is the broadest definition of not having enough food for yourself or your family. And basically what it indicates is a scale of food deprivation, a scale of food suffering.
so so we know you know that hunger and and, and skipping meals um, which which seems like the kind of thing you imagine happening in, in countries somewhere else you know happens every day here um, in our in our cities um, and you know probably way more than than most of us imagine What we've seen is that band of food insecure individuals and families has increased significantly. I judge my success and failure whether I've helped solve the problem or it's gone worse. The truth is I've been doing this two decades and the problem's gotten worse. So I and everyone else working on this issue have failed. And we have to accept that and do something different. Statistically speaking, it's one out of six. It's one out of four children under the age of six is living in a food insecure family unless you're Hispanic or black and it's one out of every three. I think everybody has like this image in their head of like a homeless person or person who's experiencing, you know, food scarcity or housing insecurity and it's not at all like one image. Um, we get people who, yeah, come in in suits, ties, uh, one like really nice shoes, and you know they've they're recently homeless. So they've recently entered a shelter, and this was obviously not the way anybody thought their life would be. Well, I don't feel that I'm entitled to anything more than anybody else, but a little help like this, and I use the word little. It's more than little, really. Uh, this, this gives you incentive to spark up your life a little bit. So it, it goes beyond just feeding us. This particular letter got to me. This woman had written saying she was having difficulty feeding her family. Her husband was sick, she had a child, whatever the details were. And it turned out she was active duty U.S. Navy. This is not an unemployed person. This person is working for the military and she can't feed her family adequately. It's not the other side of the railroad tracks, it's us. that we have a food pantry in Hunterdon County. Uh, we are considered to be one of the richest counties in the country. But that just raises the issue. Hunger affects everyone. You know, something that really struck me in doing research around food insecurity is that three quarters of the people in this country who are hungry are in households with a worker in them. 60% are in households with a full-time worker, right? So this idea that hunger or malnutrition in the U.S. is because people are lazy and they don't feel like working, right, is absolutely untrue. Like, you can work very, very hard in this country and you will still not be paid enough uh, to feed your family and sort of live like the basic middle class life that we all think that we're entitled to.
the root cause of, of hunger is obviously poverty. And so there's a lot of people out there focusing on that. And I think that that is certainly the wise way to go. And the reason we have hunger isn't about lack of food. It's lack of money to buy food. Poverty has an impact on lots of, um, you know, lots of facets of, of, of people's lives. You mentioned school, um, housing stability, those are huge. Um, and those are often, the housing stability is often the priority. Um, you know, and then what does that mean for food? So when I talk about abundance, what I mean is that we're producing about twice the amount of food that we need per person on a calorie level, and that has an impact in how we value or in most cases don't value our food. I'm in Holdridge, Nebraska, outside of the local grocery store, and all this food around me came from the trash. We're gonna run over there and go check out the dumpster real quick, and I'll show you real quick how much more food there was in there. So, this thing, if you look back here, is just loaded with food. All these boxes, you can't even tell. I mean, check this out. 20 pound bag of potatoes, 10 pound bag of potatoes. That is not going bad. This whole thing is just completely loaded with food. So, I said it before and I'll say it again. We've got no shortage of food in the United States. We've got a distribution problem. And I listened to the gentleman from Massachusetts, and he said that these kids can't, if you're hungry in school, you can't focus. I agree. I think kids need to go to school, and they need to, they need to have food in their belly, and they need to go to lunch knowing they can get all the nutritious food that they want to eat, because for many of them, that's the only decent meal they're going to get all day. What comprises this greater Philadelphia area? Well, the Delaware River is a boundary only on the maps. The Philadelphia city limits are mere road markers, pointing the way to a whole new world. Unfortunately, healthy food is very expensive, and um, come to find out that everything that's no good for you is very cheap. Um, high in soda, um, processed food, you want us to believe that it's okay for us to eat healthy, it's okay for us to have access to all this stuff, but there are grocery stores like far and few. And then the poppy stores, you know, as they call them, or the corner stores, they are every corner. You have to go there because of the conveniency. We, we see it in D.C., it is, 
incredibly uh, painfully obvious how the city is really divided into two. East of the river, Anacostia, Ward 7 and 8, the most economically marginalized areas of our city, have three full-service grocery stores. Northwest DC, one of the quadrants where most of the business in the city is focused and the upper class, middle, upper middle class residents have almost a hundred full service grocery stores. A smaller geographical area, about the same in population, but you can see the incredible disparity. The cost of the uh, diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease these are from the major organizations that work in that realm is 1.033 trillion dollars a year. That's a big number. And these are all diet related illnesses. I have never heard anybody say, you know what would be really awesome? Diabetes. Like that doesn't happen. But for people who don't have the access to the healthy food, there are much greater assurance that they're going to end up suffering from some of those diseases. For the longest time, people said, well, people in those neighborhoods, they, they, they won't eat fresh food. They don't want fresh food. And most of us said, eh, I guess that's probably right. So why bother to try? Uh, yet there were study after study done, commission panels after panels um, that, that convened and said, we have a problem. There's food deserts that exist in all of our urban areas in this country. And one thing we could do maybe to help alleviate some of this pressure would be to get fresh fruits and vegetables in corner stores. But unfortunately, that's where the discussion stopped. So we've created this mechanism, this infrastructure, uh, that we provide refrigeration, shelving, education, inventory management for these stores, uh, and provide them with subsidized products so they can build a market at no financial risk to the retailers. And what we've seen in the two plus years that we've been doing this is almost every single month, in every single store, the sales of this product are increasing. So clearly, Everyone understands the health value of eating fresh, healthy food, and if there is access available, people will take advantage of that. Most of the families that I've met, like, they care about their families, they love them, they want them to be healthy, they want to be healthy for themselves as well, and the structure and shape of their lives makes that an incredibly difficult proposition when it comes to their diet. One of the, the, the very odd and almost counterintuitive realities that we have in our country today is that we have people who are hungry and the same people are obese uh, and, and suffering from significant diet-related diseases, whether that's heart disease, diabetes, or a whole host of other diseases that could almost be eliminated through better diet. The problem is, is that on limited food dollars, people are, are looking for to pack calories in essence, and, and unfortunately, the, the biggest bang for the buck in terms of what people can buy and high calorie food is often empty calories and, and it's food that's poisoning our bodies and ultimately killing us and creating these incredibly disparate health outcomes. So we, we're, we're, we're bankrupting ourselves as a country uh, by not providing access to healthy food for everyone. It's one thing for like a single mom with two kids to be like, oh, I should eat healthier when everything at the supermarket that's easy and cheap is crap. You just tend to eat more crap. Like that's just true. And especially if you're at the point where you're getting food from food pantries and things like that, right? Those are places that are specializing in food that is shelf stable and will not go bad. And so you're really seeing people's diets skew towards, you know, highly processed, very sugary, very starchy diets, and that's just not healthy for them. This legislation is commonly referred to as the Farm Bill, but it's also a food bill. And on that note, it falls short. The snap cut 
in this bill may seem on paper, small on paper, but it's not to the families that it will affect. It's not to the food banks that are already stretched well beyond their means. In New York City, 208,000 households are expected to see their benefits drop under this bill. Those are benefits that don't go anywhere near far enough to begin with. We see every day in New York City how deep the need for food assistance is. Our food banks and community hunger organizations are doing everything they can to provide food to hungry families. When you are hungry, or you're at real risk of being hungry, you go to the place where that can be, if not cured, I don't want to say that, but certainly treated, and you go to a food pantry. Federal programs were, had largely taken hunger and food insecurity off the table as major problems in the U.S. Um, since they were fully established up until the 1980s when Ronald Reagan was president. And he cut those programs back significantly, and we had a major recession. And suddenly, mainly churches in this country were seeing very large numbers of, of people who were desperate for food in a way that we hadn't seen since the Depression. Um, and so Starting in the 1980s, we began throughout the country to establish emergency feeding programs um, everywhere. It used to, when I was growing up, these you know maybe a city like New York would have one or two places that fed people who were um, homeless, but there was a very small percentage of the population that needed that kind of emergency food program. Now you can't really even call it emergency food. It's it's programs that millions of people depend on because none of these benefits are quite enough to get you through the month. Every year we're doing more and more food drives and every year more and more people are going hungry because the demand is outstripping even the uh, amount of food recovered. Every soup kitchen, food pantry, food rescue group, food bank in America provides about one twentieth one twentieth of the amount of food distributed by the Federal Nutrition and Assistance Safety Net of SNAP, food stamps, school lunch, school breakfast, the WIC program. And that's even considering that the Federal Nutrition Assistance programs are way, way, way underutilized. So you could double, triple, quadruple charity in America and you barely dent the hunger problem. When people give food to a food drive, they're actually contributing to hunger in America, which is counterintuitive. Because if I go to a food, if my house of worship or my business or my school is having a food drive and I show up with a can of beans or a box of pasta that I bought, they get it, it goes to a food bank typically and then goes to a food pantry and that's perfectly fine. But if I had instead given to the food drive the same amount of money that I spent to buy the product in the first place, that money would have gone to the food pantry, which would have then bought the whatever they needed, possibly the same product from the food bank at 10 cents on the dollar. So when I give the box of pasta or the can of whatever, I'm actually throwing away 90% of the good I could have done. Giving away food is not the answer. We, we really have to get past that point when, of kidding ourselves that if we just build more food banks or, or if we give away more free food on the street corners or more sandwiches at the park, that people aren't going to be hungry. That will never, ever do it. The most um, important bulwark we have in this country against hunger is, is SNAP, uh, which used to be called food stamps. It's now called the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. This bill is truly worthy of its name, the Federal Agriculture Reform and Risk Management Act, because of the historic reforms it legislates. Overall, the bill repeals or consolidates about 100 programs. Along with sequestration reduction, it cuts mandatory spending by nearly $23 billion. And the conservation title alone re reduced programs from 23 down to 13. This change alone saves $6 billion, and I believe does so without undercutting the effectiveness of the needed programs. We reform food stamps, and we do so through thoughtful, targeted changes, ensuring that those who truly need the assistance will receive it. Congress has cut SNAP and other nutrition and food feeding programs over the last few years, and I think they're still going after it. That we are balancing the budget, or trying to um, pay for subsidies to big agribusinesses by taking it away from SNAP, um, I think is unconscionable. And oh, by the way, 
depending on how you define miracles, in the environment we've worked together in, this farm bill might not be quite defined by most people as a miracle, but it's amazingly close. Hunger is, is a symptom of, of poverty. There's no question about it. Uh, and we will never, ever be able to deal with hunger honestly until we recognize that it's really a basic economic inequality th that we have to solve before that we're going to get to a, to a hunger issue. We almost ended hunger entirely in the 1970s because we had higher wages and because we had a more robust social safety net. Scandinavia has virtually eliminated hunger in their societies even though they had vast hunger problems a hundred years ago. They did it by ensuring that their economy created jobs, ensured that the jobs paid a living wage, and ensured that for whom uh, jobs weren't enough, or for children or seniors or people with disabilities, there was a robust safety net. We could implement these policies in America tomorrow if there was the political will to do it, and we could end hunger entirely. It's going to take more investment, more social and, and political will to eliminate hunger. When you're talking about making big changes that require political will and public support, right, you can't treat it as if it's like this artisanal, like niche market thing, right? It's got to be something broader and bigger. Because if you're b able to build political support on something, it doesn't just mean like there's some political backing. It's going to mean, right, that there's broad support. In too many instances, uh, you get people in positions of power who haven't even thought about it. Uh, and so we need to build a movement in this country uh, and, um, you know, and demand that our government respond to this, uh, this challenge. Like I said before, this is all solvable. We need to build a grassroots movement from the bottom up, including and prominently featuring low-income Americans speaking out on their own behalf to make it unacceptable to have politicians who keep voting to increase this problem. If we want to make that kind of broad change in the American food system, right, we have to figure out a way to do it that can build a broad political base as opposed to thinking that's just going to be the people with a lot of money who are going to lead us forward. A lot of times you can't relate until you walked in somebody's shoes. You have no clue of the struggle, the hardship, and you cannot have somebody that ate off a silver platter all their lives have them understand the real struggle of what hunger really is. In the past year, I have traveled not only across our own land, but to other lands, to the north and the south and across the seas. And I have found, as I am sure you have in your travels, that people everywhere, in spite of occasional disappointments, look to us, not to our wealth or power, but to the splendor of our ideals. For our nation is commissioned by history to be either an observer of freedom's failure or the cause of its success. Our overriding obligation in the months ahead is to fulfill the world's hopes by fulfilling our own faith. That task must begin at home. For if we cannot fulfill our own ideals here, we cannot expect others to accept them. And when the youngest child alive today has grown to the cares of manhood, our position in the world will be determined, first of all, by what provisions we make today for his education, his health, his opportunities for a good home and a good job and a good life.
come near I just gotta be fair But 